In Victor Hugo's epic novel, Les Miserables, the protagonist, Jean Valjean, is an ex-con who had served years of hard labor for stealing a loaf of bread. After his eventual parole, Jean is shown mercy by a village priest who gives him shelter and food. In return, the embittered Jean steals the, sil the silver table settings of the priest and runs off. He is arrested by suspicious police and brought back to the home of the priest to confirm the theft and return the silver. When John stands before him, obviously guilty, the priest lies and insists that the silver was a gift. That, and not only that, he insists that John take the silver candlesticks as well. This unexpected act of mercy transforms Jean Valjean from a callous criminal into a kind-hearted businessman living under a new name who eventually becomes a respected small-town mayor. The past, however, refuses to remain buried. When helping a man being crushed beneath a broken cart, Jean's strength reveals his former self to a public, uh, excuse me, to a police inspector named Javert, who recognizes the thief he once knew and sets about trying to ruin the new life that Jean has built upon the foundation of that priest's mercy. What Jean once was seems inescapable, no matter who he now is. For the justice of Inspector Javert has no room for mercy and no second chances. I won't tell you how the story ends, I don't want to give it all the way, it's only 200 years old, but uh, that's the meat of the matter. In our text today, Paul will remind the people of the Church of Corinth what they once were, but not to destroy them like Javert, not to humiliate them and bring them down, but to remind them that unlike Jean Valjean, They've been set free from their past. Let's begin then in verse 9, the first half of it says this, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? After writing to the church at Corinth about two examples of unacceptable behavior within the church, and we've looked at those the last few weeks, he wrote about sexual immorality, and he wrote about divisive squabbles and lawsuits. Paul now takes a step back to remind the Christians at Corinth about the big picture. Perspective is an important thing. We can easily lose the forest when we're looking at the trees, or vice versa. So as a church struggling to live up to the high calling of discipleship, they need to be reminded about the fundamental things. So Paul will return to the basics and restate what they already know to help them regain perspective. So let's look at that thought. Why can't the wicked inherit the kingdom of God? The answer is quite simple. God decides who will and who won't enter heaven. So that leads you to the question, on what basis does God do so? The righteous are welcome into heaven, and the wicked are denied entry. Well, who decides what the definitions of righteous and wicked are? Well, naturally, God does, for both are based upon his own nature. To emulate God is righteousness. To do the opposite and rebel against the nature of God is wickedness. Thus, heaven will contain people who are like God in their embrace of righteousness, and it won't contain anyone who is unlike God in their continued embrace of wickedness. Which, of course, leads us to one of the most important questions that we hopefully ask in our lives. Am I righteous? That ought to be quickly followed by these thoughts in your mind. How can I be with what I've done? At that moment, when we're honestly self-evaluating ourselves, comes the next question, also an important one. Well, what can I do about it? I may not be righteous. But can I be? Those questions Paul already answered when he first brought the gospel to Corinth. He will remind the church at Corinth and us about the answers when we get down to verse 11. Notice the term that he used here, inherit. That's not a fluke, but it's on purpose. It doesn't say they will not earn the kingdom of heaven or gain or claim 
all of which involve the notion that God is bound somehow by what we do. The heaven can be ours because of what we accomplish in life. An inheritance, however, carries a very different feeling than that of a paycheck. People inherit because of their father's or their mother's generosity, because of that love, by being part of that family, not because of what they've done or not done, but because of who they are. Members, excuse me, remember that heaven is inherited and not earned when we look at Paul's explanation of how God's people end up being righteous and thus inheriting heaven in verse 11. So this first point, that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God, seems simple enough. The wicked are not part of the family of God, and all those who remain in wickedness are confirming by their actions that they don't belong to God's family. So how could we expect them to inherit? The second part of the verse and into verse 10 says this, Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Paul begins that list by saying, don't be deceived. Before we look at the list that Paul gives us as an example of the many different types of wickedness, we need to consider first why he says, do not be deceived. There are several possible ways in which one might be deceived about the issue of wickedness. First off, someone might deny that the things on the list are actually wicked. Perhaps they redefine them, perhaps they re-examine them, and to conclude that they are in fact neutral things, or even good things. A second thing someone might do to be deceived might be that they are self-deluded that God doesn't actually care about these things. They might say, well, they may be wicked, but God doesn't really care. Those things are small potatoes. They don't really matter. Thirdly, and related to that, still other people might convince themselves that God isn't concerned with this kind of behavior, that perhaps this behavior is personal or private and not subject to the purview of God. Unfortunately, Paul says none of those things are true, because these things that I'm about to say are wicked, for God has defined them as such. And that judgment remains, for wickedness and righteousness are incompatible with each other. And yes, these categories of behavior do matter, for with God all of our lives matter, both public and private, everything we think, say, and do. God has the right and the power to judge it all. So don't be deceived. Don't be deluded. Don't be tricked. Don't be persuaded. That which God has declared, only God can alter. So let's look at the list and see what's on it. Have you ever noticed that none of Paul's lists in his letters, either if he's talking about uh, righteousness and virtues, or if he's talking about immorality and wickedness, none of those lists are exactly the same. Now perhaps that reflects an effort on Paul's part to focus on the particular vices that his intended readers struggle with the most. Maybe these are the things that in Corinth they were really struggling with, so these are the ten things that he decides to talk about. Or maybe it also indicates an unwillingness on Paul's part to let people believe that any of these lists are exhaustive, as if these are all the wicked things and there are no others. Hopefully that by doing and changing his list, he achieves both of those ends. For example, let me talk about one that's not on the list. Murder is clearly a moral evil. We know that. It's the epitome of wickedness. But Paul doesn't have to, make, to mention it every time he lists one or two or more things that are wicked in order to maintain the idea that murder is wicked. And certainly not all the things on a list are equally destructive. Two actions don't have to be equivalent to both be wicked and both be therefore such subject to the judgment of a holy God. Remember that Paul began by saying, don't be deceived. In the past year, to pick a, a suitable time frame. 
I've heard from people and read things written by a number of self-proclaimed Christians who are unabashedly, publicly, and loudly promoting the idea that there is nothing whatsoever immoral about the form of sexual immorality that falls under the general heading of homosexual behavior. In fact, some of these same advocates have declared a variety of behaviors that are associated with that category to not only no longer be thought of as wicked, but instead good, loving, even holy. Now, without judging the motives and intentions of a fellow Christian who has come to believe that idea, as someone myself who believes that the Word of God is inspired and authoritative in all things, I cannot but conclude that they have been deceived not on the basis of what I think or feel about it, hopefully, for that ought to be irrelevant, but on the basis of what God has said about it. We lack not only the wisdom to second-guess God, but the right and authority as well. To defy the Word of God by seeking to redefine wickedness to our liking is a perilous choice indeed. Now, there are ten things in this list that Paul just made, and maybe you feel a bit self-righteous thinking that those who have walked away from the teaching of the Word of God on one of them, maybe you're looking down your nose on them and saying, oh, those poor people. Don't be. Because in the past year, I have also heard from and read the words of self-professed Christians who are unabashedly, publicly, and loudly, loudly promoting the idea that it is possible to be an unrepentant adulterer, a slanderer, swindler, and a person full of greed, and yet still be considered a fine Christian person. As if those vices are of small account. In comparison, of course, with homosexual behavior, which many of these same people are gladly condemning. Unfortunately, their blind spot has deceived them as well. You cannot have it both ways. If one behavior is a wicked sin, then they all are. Yet both sides in this divide, and this roughly divides the church today in America, both sides will defend that which God has declared to be immoral behavior in the people that think and act and look like they do, but condemn a different example of immoral behavior in people that think and look and act like them. The hypocrisy is blatant, it ought to be obvious, and it's destructive to both the character and the witness of God's people. We cannot pick and choose which forms of wickedness we will accept and which we will reject. Because sin is sin. It is defined by the Word of God, not by public opinion, not by legal decisions. If any of those claiming the name of Jesus Christ are saying otherwise, they're wrong. If they are saying that because it is politically advantageous for them to do so, then shame on them. What great fools are we if we abandon the unchanging authority and power of the revealed Word of God for the temporary and illusory power of the laws and governments of men? The approval or disapproval of society is of little account in comparison to the judgment of our Savior and our God. It makes me wonder sometimes if we really know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God, if we really do believe that. Because so many things we say and do and believe contradict that statement. Do we really believe that about all ten things on that list, and not just the few that bother us? We ought to be deeply concerned for those who claim to know Jesus, but continue to walk in wickedness of whatever strife and whatever kind. For how can that, that profession of faith be true if immorality still has a firm hold on a person's life? That person cannot be, uh, excuse me, cannot be indwelt by the Holy Spirit and must not therefore have been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. You see, there is no such thing 
as an immoral Christian. It's impossible. It cannot exist. Now, that does not mean that God's people don't still sin. Obviously, we do. We know that we do. We'd be fools to deny it. We all fail far too often. But we cannot continue to walk in wickedness. If the struggle against sin is not evident, but instead is replaced by a delight in vice, if humility and repentance are nowhere to be found, there is absolutely no reason to believe that that person is a child of God. Now you might have a family, a family member, a friend, you might think that that, you, in mind, someone that you're thinking about, that you say, that is a good person. They may even say, I am a Christian. And yet, if that person is sexually immoral, a thief, a drunkard, a slanderer, that's just four of the ten things, and this list is not exhaustive. If that person is walking in wickedness, embracing immorality, that person cannot be living by the Spirit of God. We cannot allow a personal connection, or even a bond of friendship or love, to persuade us to excuse as irrelevant wicked behavior, especially when that behavior is done without shame and done habitually. Just because you know someone who seems to be okay, even while they're continuing to maintain a sinful habit, does not make that behavior inconsequential. Sin always has consequences. For God has promised that he will judge the world. God has declared the standard by which he will judge. How insane is our ego if we think we can ignore Almighty God? As Paul said here, the wicked will not enter the kingdom of God. And here is where the whole passage turns dramatically. The first half of verse 11. And that is what some of you were. The key words were. Not our, not, excuse me, not are, not continue to be, not remain, but were. The people of the church of Corinth used to be idolaters and adulterers and greedy swindlers. They used to be collectively all of those ten things and more. They were a wicked people, some of them more than others, but wicked one and all. How does Paul know that about them? Well, obviously he knew them. He'd helped bring the gospel to them, helped bring them out of the darkness into the light. But even if Paul had never met any of them, he could have said the exact same thing because people are the same everywhere. Humanity, both the ones that we think of as good people and the worst people we know, are all fallen. We all have lived in bondage to sin. We all fell short of the holiness of God. We all stood condemned by our Creator for our rebellion against Him. That is what we were, what we all were. In other words, none of us should inherit the kingdom of God. None deserve to be called a son or a daughter of God. This would be a hopeless diagnosis if we didn't also know that God chose to do something about it. God didn't choose to lower his standards. God didn't choose to let the small-time sinners into heaven, if such exist. God didn't redefine his own morality. God had something far more spe spectacular and amazing in mind. One plan, a plan that rejected sin, but saved the sinners. And so we'll look at that in the second half of verse 12. It says this, But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All three of those things describe different aspects of the same gift that God gave to wayward humanity, that is, salvation. First, God washed us clean of our past, of our sin and our guilt, something we symbolize in baptism. The Bible uses the metaphor of being washed in the blood of the Lamb, but coming out of that process whiter than snow. Wickedness needs to be washed away. 
For as Paul said, the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. God also sanctified us, setting us apart for his purpose and calling us to be a holy and righteous people who live by his commands. Lastly, God declared us to be righteous, justifying us in his sight, not because of our righteousness, for it could never measure up, but because of the righteousness that is exceedingly great of his Son. This entire process of salvation is accomplished by the Spirit of God, by grace, through faith. It will not be fully realized until we stand with him in glory, but it has already begun in all those who believe, and God will complete it. We were sinners. We were mired in wickedness. But by the grace of God, that is no longer who we are. Because of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. You see, only the righteous will inherit the kingdom of God. Those who remain in wickedness will remain apart from God. There are no exceptions to that rule. Only those whom God has declared righteous by washing, sanctifying, and justifying them, in other words, by saving them, only those who will be judged by God to be righteous. There's no other path, no other plan that will work. And only those whose faith and hope are in the saving power of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Only they will be declared righteous by God. For Jesus is indeed the way, the truth, and the life. It's not for us to add or subtract from the gospel, nor can we afford to be deceived about what it really says. For we were once sinners too. We were lost and without hope until God freed us from sin that we might deny it in all of its forms, from greatest to least, that we might deny sin and embrace righteousness. 